Ladies, gentlemen, and adventurers of all ages, when it comes to items of Baldur's Gate 3, you can be really surprised at what you'll find. Sometimes you'll spend two hours working out how to get a specific legendary item and then be a bit disappointed when you actually see what it does. But sometimes you'll just be wandering around, happen across a green item, and it's the strongest thing that you've seen in the entire game. We've talked about items in this game in various ways before, but today we are going to focus on the 10 strongest items currently in Baldur's Gate 3, with the one caveat that none of them can be legendaries for this. Legendaries are strong generally, you would expect them to be. We are pretty much aware of all of them, every one of us, but there is definitely a decent chance that you won't be aware of every item on this list, and well, considering that they are here because of how much they can buff your character or even your party up, it's definitely worth being aware of them. Without further ado then, let's start off with our first item of the day, Phalar Aluve. Most people are pretty well aware of this one by this point, but this is a rare sword that you can find super early on, pretty much as soon as you enter the Underdark area in Act 1. The exact location of the sword is right here on your map, and you have to successfully complete some checks to actually get it for yourself, but it's really quite simple overall. As far as what makes this so strong then, it is a long sword that counts as a finesse weapon, which already makes it quite unique in itself, then it lets you once per short rest cast one version of Phalar Aluv Melody, its unique weapon skill. This uses an action to either put a buff on yourself and surrounding allies for 5 turns that gives them a bonus 1d4 to attack rolls, as well as charisma, wisdom, and int saving throws too, or alternatively you can cast a debuff to all nearby enemies for 5 turns, giving them a 1d4 penalty to Charisma, Wisdom, and Int saving throws, as well as making these enemies take a bonus 1d4 of thunder damage when they're hit. Overall, this is just a combination of various goodness, as well as the variety of choice you get from the bonus effect having two options, and how strong each of these options actually is. Our second item of the day, then, is any of these three, or the other handful of items in the game that interact with lightning charges as a mechanic, as a concept. Though I will count the Spell Sparkler as probably the most important one of this bunch. What this does is anytime you deal damage with a spell or a cantrip, you get two lightning charges. Each lightning charge gives you plus one to attack rolls and makes any damage you deal also do one additional lightning damage. When you hit five stacks, it pops for an explosion of damage for 1d8, consuming all of your charges and you start again. The main reason this is great is it inflicts the bonus damage with every instance of spell damage that hits. So if you do an area spell and people walk through it in between turns, that's bonus damage. If you do a multi-hit spell or cantrip, or maybe you're just a fan of Eldritch Blast, you can build up stacks super quickly and use it to just do a butt ton of bonus damage really quickly. I've seen people hit ridiculous numbers with builds based around lightning charges, and the main perpetrators of this are the weapons themselves. There is one that gives you lightning charges on melee hits, there is one that gives you lightning charges on ranged hits, and one that gives them on spell or cantrip hit. And if you can only have one of these per playthrough, because you have to choose between them the way that you get them, is actually a choice between the three as a quest reward. Specifically for saving the Grand Duke from Joaquin's rest in the fire that has been blazing in in Act 1. Third up today is actually a pair of items, specifically ring. The main important one here is the Coruscation Ring. This makes it so spell damage that you do while illuminated by a light source also inflicts Radiating Orb on a target. This effect gives the target minus one to attack rolls per remaining turn of the debuff and also makes it shed light in an area around it. The combo piece to this, our second ring, is the Callous Glow Ring. This makes it so you deal two additional points of damage anytime that you do damage if the target that you hit is illuminated. The coolest part of this is you can split these up through your party, put the Coruscation Ring on your spellcaster, put the Kellis Glow Ring on a fighter or something like that for all those extra attacks in the same turn, all benefiting from the bonus damage. But the idea is, even if you put both of them on a caster, even a cantrip just gets plus two damage permanently. And if you can chain the buildup of this radiating orb, you can significantly nerf your enemy as well with the attack roll penalty too. As for actually getting these then, for the Coruscation Ring, just east of the Last Light Inn from the island itself, there is a small path that you can follow to an abandoned house. Inside of the house, there are some roots that you can climb down, and at the bottom of the roots, there is a door. Behind the door, there is a chest that is trapped and locked, so get through all that, and inside of the chest you'll find the ring. For the Callous Glow Ring, this is in the Gauntlet of Shar. In the room right beside Balthazar, there is a locked vault door to the treasure room on the north side. Simply lockpick this door, and you can find the ring in one of the chests behind it. Fourth, then, we have the Spell Crux Amulet. This one is actually very simple, no deep explanation really needed. This is just an amulet that has nothing on it but one special class action, Spell Slot Restoration. Once per long rest, this uses a bonus action to replenish an expended spell slot of any level, which may as well read as, hey, you can cast one bonus six level spell per long rest, which is an insanely strong boon to have on a properly built spellcaster. No matter what stage of the game that you are at, an extra slot of your highest spell level is always incredible to have for you. As far as how to get them, in Act 2 in Moonrise Tower, there's a basement level that you can enter through a hatch that brings you down to the prison of the area. In the central tower of the prison, there is a warden, and if you kill the warden, you can loot this amulet from their body. For our fifth item today, we have the Spellmite Glove. 
and I know I'm going to start sounding like a broken record, but these are incredibly good to have. After all, it's sort of the entire point of this collection video. Every one of these items is astonishingly good. What these gloves do then is essentially act as the great weapon master feat, but for offensive spellcasters. This gives you a minus five penalty to any spell attack roll that you make, but it also causes any spells that you cast to do a bonus 1d8 of damage. Later on in the game, when you have a really high hit chance, these become exceptionally strong of an item to carry around on the right character, and it mixes as well with some of our other items on the list too, which is pretty nice to see. As far as getting them, at the start of Act 3, there is a circus in Rivington where you start out. At this circus, the ringleader is an NPC called Lucretius. They will give you a long winding quest that gives these gloves as a reward after you wander around and collect all the things they're after, or you can just pickpocket off of them yourself, just skip all that questing stuff entirely up to you, both methods will get you these gloves. Sixth up is an absolutely nuts pair of gloves that you'd be ecstatic to use on any martial weapon attacking party members, the Legacy of the Master gloves. These things simply make you stronger in combat by a significant margin, and they cover a lot of bases as far as how many classes, subclasses, and builds that can take advantage of them. Their actual effect then is simply a plus two bonus to both attack and damage rolls with weapons always permanently, meaning while these gloves are on you, every single weapon attack and damage roll that you do is guaranteed to be just that little bit higher, which can really add up on a character with multiple attacks per turn, like a fighter for example. As for how to get them, you buy them from Damon the Smith at the Forge of the Nine location in the lower city of Baldur's Gate in Act 3. As for our seventh item today, this actually comes from the same location from the same vendor, but is somehow a significantly even better item than the previous one, and fills a very different role. This is the Armor of Persistence. This is pretty much just far and away the strongest heavy armor in the entire game. Probably even the strongest armor slot as a whole, at least defensively speaking specifically. This gives you 20 AC as a baseline when equipped, which is really great to start off with. Then it also reduces all incoming damage by two, no matter what, which is fantastic. And then as if that wasn't enough, it gives you permanent resistance, which is a bonus 1d4 to all saving throws. And permanent blade ward, which just makes you take half damage from bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage forever. In other words, one of the ma major effects of Barbarian Rage as a class mechanic, except on heavy armor that you can use on a non-barbarian class, and it also has base damage reduction and stupid high armor class to begin with. It's just pretty much unbeatable, and the fact that it is simply sold from a vendor means there's no real excuse not to have it on a heavy armor wearer within your party. After that, for number eight, we have the Staff of Spell Power. This is for all intents and purposes, just a slight touch less good than the full-on legendary staff in Act 3. And the crazy part is you can actually use both of them together. If you take the dual-wielding feat on a spellcaster, you can carry both this weapon and the legendary staff together at the same time to get the effects from both of them. And they actually align quite ridiculously well with each other. The staff of spell power then comes with plus one bonus to spell save DC and spell attack rolls as well, which the legendary staff does too, so you can double up that bonus. And again, both weapons have arcane battery, a toggleable passive which once prolonged rest lets you cast your next spell for free and without consuming a spell slot. On top of which, if you are a sorcerer specifically, it also doesn't consume meta magic used to cast the spell too, so you can get some really, really funky bonuses going. Combine this staff, the legendary staff, and the spell crux amulet that I mentioned earlier, and that gives you three bonus up to six level spell slots per long rest on a late game character. If that doesn't sound silly strong to you, then I don't know what does. As far as getting this staff then, inside of the House of Hope area in Act 3, on the north end of the upper area here, there is an inert gem on the wall that you'll notice if you walk up close enough. From there, you have to interact with it and pass a couple of skill checks, and then you'll find the secret treasure room. One of the items laying around in here, then, is the staff. Then for number nine, and sort of also number 10, as this is two items, but we're just gonna count it as one entry, we are also in the House of Hope. The first of these two is the Gauntlets of Hill Giant Strength. These give you plus one to strength saving throws, but much more importantly, they set the wearer's strength stat to 23, having no effect if the wearer has more strength without them. This lets you do some really funky stuff. 23 is higher than you will ever reach naturally really in the game, so this makes them great even for strength-focused characters, especially as this lets you go to withers and respect all your strength out into other stats, and just really beef yourself up and round out some of your other stats while still having really high strength. This is located in the archives room of the House of Hope, just sitting around waiting to be stolen. The other item then is the Amulet of Greater Health, which is very, very similar, setting the wearer's constitution score to 23 instead of strength, and granting advantage on constitution saving throws too. This one is pretty massive for anyone, really. If you have a character who is up in the front lines, but sort of squishy still, like a rogue is a really good example, you can just whack this amulet on if it doesn't get in the way of your build, and suddenly you have a buttload more health than you would have otherwise. This is found in the exact same room as the glove, 
gloves as well, just on the other side of it. Then finally, as I sort of counted those last two as one entry, we'll go with one more super strong item, and for this I've chosen the Reviving Hands Gloves. Every successful party in this game will have a healer of some sort in their composition, and these are just the tippity toppest tier gloves that a healer can have in the whole game. When you heal a creature while wearing these, it gains two turns of Blade Ward, which is half damage from all physical damage types, really just upping the survivability of an entire party, especially when you consider things like Mass Healing Word or Channel Divinity Group Heal on a Cleric. And that's not even it, because when you revive a creature, they also get Death Ward, which makes it so the next time they would go to zero hit points, they instead stay at one. So basically, a cheat death once per revive as well. And because why would that be enough? It also has plus one to strength saving throws and lets you cast Revivify once per long rest for free to get a bonus revive. Essentially, this can just make the damage intake of your entire party significantly reduced, and for obvious reasons, that is incredibly good to have around. As for how to get it, these gloves are purchased from a vendor who doesn't show up on your map as a vendor unless you talk to them first, located in the Stormshore Tabernacle area of the Lower City. And that just about does it, everyone. Ten of the best, most powerful items in all of Baldur's Gate 3, excluding the obvious contenders, which are the legendaries, yes, most of these turned out to be purple items in the end, which still shows that rarity is a factor, but we also have a couple of blues and a green, so hey, if three of the most powerful items in the bottom two rarity brackets for items, that is still really good, right? In any case, let me know what you all think about all these items, let me know more items that you think are equally or maybe even more powerful in your own opinion, and I might do another one of these in the future with another group of particularly strong items around the game. Like if you liked the video, subscribe and hit the notification bell for more, and most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay sweet. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world our stage Is, uh, goodbye